full. We affectionately know of ourselves as HARP. We welcome you to this live stream of our morning worship service. We're thankful that you are here. If, if you're encouraged by what you hear, we'd love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also for you to visit our church website, uh, harp.church. We believe in the power of God's holy word and we love to share the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as we preach and teach God's word. We're grateful that you're here and we ask that you would now join us as we worship our living God and avail ourselves of his means of grace. This is your invitation. Come just the way you Good morning. My name is Lee Shelnut, and I'm the pastor of the Huntersville Associate Reform Presbyterian Church. That's a, that's a mouthful. We affectionately know of ourselves as HARP. We welcome you to this live stream of our morning worship service. We're thankful that you are here. If, if you're encouraged by what you hear, we'd love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also for you to visit our church website, uh, harp.church. We believe in the power of God's holy word and we love to share the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as we preach and teach God's word. We're grateful that you're here and we ask that you would now join us as we worship our living God and avail ourselves of his means of grace. This is your invitation. Come just the way you are. Good morning. My name is Lee Shelnut, and I'm the pastor of the Huntersville Associate Reform Presbyterian Church. That's a, that's a mouthful. We affectionately know of ourselves as HARP. We welcome you to this live stream of our morning worship service. We're thankful that you are here. If, if you're encouraged by what you hear, we'd love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also for you to visit our church website, uh, harp.church. We believe in the power of God's holy word and we love to share the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as we preach and teach God's word. We're grateful that you're here and we ask that you would now join us as we worship our living God and avail ourselves of his means of grace. This is your invitation. Come just the way you Good morning. My name is Lee Shelnut, and I'm the pastor of the Huntersville Associate Reform Presbyterian Church. That's a, that's a mouthful. We affectionately know of ourselves as HARP. We welcome you to this live stream of our morning worship service. We're thankful that you are here. If, if you're encouraged by what you hear, we'd love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also for you to visit our church website, uh, harp.church. We believe in the power of God's holy word and we love to share the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as we preach and teach God's word. We're grateful that you're here and we ask that you would now join us as we worship our living God and avail ourselves of his means of grace. This is your invitation. Come just the way you are. Good morning. My name is Lee Shelnut, and I'm the pastor of the Huntersville Associate Reform Presbyterian Church. That's a, that's a mouthful. We affectionately know of ourselves as HARP. We welcome you to this live stream of our morning worship service. 
We're thankful that you are here. If, if you're encouraged by what you hear, we'd love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also for you to visit our church website, uh, harp.church. We believe in the power. I got quiet so early today. <laughs> Guess we'll just go ahead and uh, get started. It's good to be together again in the house of the Lord on a Sunday morning, or as the ARPs would say, the Sabbath morning. <laughs> it's good to have everybody uh, and visitors, any visitors who are with us, and those who are with us by uh, live stream. We do have some announcements. If you, have, if you are a guest, we are glad to have you, and we'd ask you to give us uh, some information to follow up and, and give you a visit or a call in the bulletin itself or back in the register. <clears throat> also, if you haven't gotten your communion elements, you can do it right now in the front or back in the vestibule or during one of the hymns. It would be a good time also. We do have coffee and some snack every uh, Sunday morning about 8.30, more or less. <laughs> uh, so if you feel like getting your coffee here with a few other people, they do have, the inquirers class has been meeting in that fellowship hall and they thought the coffee was just for them because they, they're so special. <laughs> but anybody's welcome. Of course, they won't be meeting any longer, right? Did y'all finish today, I believe? Or oh, pretty, pretty quick. Uh, then the Ladies Circle of Grace has an announcement. Uh, this is a good time to join this group because they're going to Hallbrook Park and then to Latta Plantation. You'll notice the announcements there. We do have a congregational meeting after the service. It'll be a very short, uh, Lord willing. So we won't take a, real, a break or anything as soon as we have the benediction. If there's a visitor that needs to leave or would like to leave, you feel free to leave. But you can stay too because it really shouldn't uh, take but a couple minutes. Sam has given his word, and if it takes longer, we can get on to him. So be f feel free to stay and then have fellowship uh, with everybody after, but you can leave if you need to. Uh, we have a meeting also right after the congregational meeting about a trip to Rwanda. So if anybody has any interest, or even if you want to hear about it more so you can pray uh, for the group that will poss possibly and probably be going to Rwanda this summer, uh, come on and to the fellowship hall after the congregational meeting. The Joy Club also has a, a really nice announcement of a fellowship uh, club picnic. So that'll be June the 26th. It's in your insert in your bulletins. Also, the media team is asking for volunteers to join them, and you'll see that announcement in your bulletin as well. Please let uh, someone know if you're interested. You don't have to be a young person. In age, you can be a young person at heart, I suppose. Just anybody with interest in helping out with the, with the audio and uh, the control up in the top there in the balcony. <coughs> Also, if you look at your June calendar, just don't forget that there's no Wednesday night services during the summer. There will be other activities as usual. Uh, the men's breakfast, I think the men's fellowship is not until the 21st, if this is correct. <clears throat> there's a synod meeting in the middle there, uh, which is very important. So if you do uh, remember, pray uh, for the synod meeting, which is up in Bond Clark, and I believe it's starting this week, yeah, you're getting ready to go, aren't you? Okay, let's prepare now for our time of worship. You'll notice the prayer of preparation. You can read silently. I encourage you to look at the call to worship. It's a little longer than usual. I'll lead the first part, read the first part, and then we'll all read together, and we'll be standing for that. <clears throat> let's now prepare for worship.
Let us stand for our call to worship today. <clears throat> oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your cre creatures. Here is a sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it, to play in the sea. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. <clears throat> when you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. All together, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have been. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Let us sing to the Lord now, number 12. Exalt the Lord, his praise proclaim.
remain standing. Our Father, you are great and greatly to be praised. Thank you for calling us together today to praise your name, to sing your praises, to exalt your name. We thank you that you are Lord over all the creation, the great sea creatures, the birds that we see out in out our windows. We thank you for all the things that you have made. It doesn't just come by chance, but you are the creator, and we praise you today. And we thank you that you are being praised throughout the world. You have people in every place, and we just ask that the church would extend even further in all the nooks and crannies, in all the mountains and cities and neighborhoods, and that Jesus would be exalted everywhere. We ask, Lord, that you would help us now as we pray together the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to our time of confession of our sins and our need of grace, we're reminded sometimes we come into church and we have a burden on us. We have committed some sin or we've fallen back into something that has caused us trouble in the past and we had gotten some victory and here we, and this week we may have fallen again. So we may come as, as with a burden and that is really good. That's why we have this time to come and unburden, to pray, to ask for forgiveness, to acknowledge our sins. Don't pretend. Don't come in pretending that everything's okay if when you have that burden that you want to, to have God lift from your shoulder. It can only be lifted by coming meekly and humbly to him, confessing, and then he will forgive and give that lifting of that burden. But I think a greater danger is often we come with indifference. Things are going smoothly, things are going well, maybe we had a good week, and we just come in here feeling okay. That's not necessarily bad, but we have to be careful. It can turn into indifference. So even when we read this, it, we need to put it in our minds and our hearts to have it already when we are tempted, when we do fall into sin. That's one reason we come every week to be reminded, to repeat over and over. Every week we need to just reinforce what we already know. So let's look to God now and, and ask him for forgiveness, but also hide these words in our heart so when we need them during the week, we can call out to God for help. Just look at these words that we're going to say together. We're asking God to unmask our sin. Sometimes our indifference leads us to we don't even realize we have a sin. We need God to show it to us. We need God to uh, wound our hearts, to break it, to wound it, to mold it. Sometimes we cannot even see our own sins. We are just cold, and we need God to come in and break us, and, and sometimes that happens in some difficult ways. But God can do it, and if we are humble before him, we don't have to go through all those really hard, diff difficult situations to break us, uh, to humble us before him. We can learn to humble our hearts and to look to him for his grace. So the, God, the, <clears throat> the word from God's law today is one we've heard before. But it summarizes uh, parts of the Ten Commandments here in Deuteronomy 5, 17 to 20. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Let's read together. Eternal Father, you are good beyond all thought. But I am sinful, miserable, and blind. My lips are ready to confess, but my heart is slow to feel. 
and my ways reluctant to amend. I bring my soul to you, break it, wound it, and mold it. Unmask to me sin's deformity, that I may hate it and flee from it. Grant me to know that the way of transgressors is hard, that evil paths are wretched paths, and that to depart from you is to lose all good. I have seen the purity and beauty of thy perfect law, the happiness of those in whose heart it reigns. Yet I daily violate and condemn its precepts. All those sins I mourn and for them cry, pardon. More profound and abiding repentance. Grant that through the tears of repentance I may see more clearly the brightness and glories of the saving work of Jesus Christ on my behalf. In his name I trust. Amen. And God doesn't leave us in the state of sorrow and mourning, but he gives us assurance of pardon in this word. 1 John 2.12 says, I am writing to you little children. And that's his uh, affectionate way of John and uh, uh, Jesus himself to speak of his followers as little children. I'm writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Amen. Let's stand now and confess our faith together as we have come to Jesus and received his pardon. Let's read together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the wicked and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and Anthony will come for our scripture lesson. As you turn to your copy of the Gospel of John in chapter 14, just to remind us of one of the most famous lines of scripture which defines Christianity from every other religion. And it's right before what we're about to read, where Jesus told his disciples, I am the way and the truth and the life that no one comes to the Father except through me. So let's read God's word from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, starting at verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. 
For with you, O God, is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Children are welcome to come to the front now as Paul will deliver the children's message. Come on down. How are we doing this morning? Good. That's good to hear. I've got a story for you guys. So a long time ago, when I was almost y'all's age, I went in a cave. We went cave exploring. And we were going through this cave, and we would have nearly gotten lost had it not been for a guide. When we went to the cave, they, 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 went, they sent a guide with us to show us the ins and outs of the cave. And we went pretty far back in this cave, and he knew exactly where he was going. He had a little light, and he would take us certain ways, and he would show us what was going on. And as I said earlier, we would have gotten entirely lost because this cave had so many twists and turns and it was entirely pitch black the whole way. Well, in a way, the passage of scripture, what God is saying is kind of like that guide that I mentioned in that, in that cave. God says that he is going to give us the Holy Spirit. And Jesus calls him the helper. He says at the end of that passage, I'm going to send with you a helper. Now, you probably are wondering, now, I don't, see a, I don't see a helper around us. I don't see a guide like in that cave. Well, that's because the Holy Spirit lives in us. And that's something that I want to talk about today. The passage of Scripture said that the Holy Spirit is dwelling inside of us. Now, even for me, that's kind of hard to understand what exactly that looks like or what might, that might be like. But think for a moment, maybe if, you, if your mom or your dad told you not to do something. Maybe they told you not to go get another cookie out of the cookie jar. And you wanted to, you really wanted to, but you felt like you felt like you shouldn't do it. Well, that's actually the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit that's convicting your heart to do the right thing. Or maybe think, think about if you said something kind of mean, maybe to your brother or to your sister, and you think, I really shouldn't have said that. And you go back to them and you say, hey, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. That feeling that you feel inside of you when you've done something wrong, that's the Holy Spirit. And he's convicting you to do the right thing. And convicting is kind of a big word that essentially means persuading you, telling you to do the right thing. And that's we know that because the passage of Scripture says that the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. And not only does the Holy Spirit convict us to do the right thing, the Holy Spirit guides us. As I mentioned only earlier, the Holy Spirit is kind of like a guide. The Holy Spirit helps us through life, helps us make decisions. It guides us to do the right thing. And not only does it help us guide us to do the right thing, the Holy Spirit helps us to know God the Father deeper. And that's probably one of the biggest things we can learn from this passage, is that we can be encouraged because we have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit in our hearts, and the Holy Spirit is continually, continuing to teach us more about the Father. Think about when you pray, or think about when the when the passage of scripture was read, when you hear those words, there's more going on than just listening to a story. The Holy Spirit is actually teaching you, teaching you more about the Bible, teaching you more about this world, and teaching you more about God. And that's what we want to do, right? We want to learn more about God the Father. And the Holy Spirit can do that because the Holy Spirit dwells with each and every one of you inside your heart. So let's fold our hands and bow our heads and let's pray that the Lord will give us more of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture that teaches us that you have sent us a helper, that you have sent us the Holy Spirit, that we are not alone in this world, that though we may feel alone, we have been given a comforter, that is the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we are ever grateful for your word. And for the blessing of the Holy Spirit that you have sent to us. Lord, may we be drawn closer to you this week. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes. 
to steal the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. With the psalmist, we wonder why you care for us, why you have called us and given us faith. We only know that our hope is in Jesus. We thank you for salvation and your mercies. Lord, we do not deserve the grace you shower on us. Help us to show grace to others. We pray for Shirley Brown, Robert Brown, Jean Liebner, Myron Alice Ingram, Josie Barbie, Katie Hancock, as they are in care facilities. For those who can't be here, for Bob and Janice Reese, and for others, we ask that they feel your presence. Lord, we thank you for your healing Heidi's, in Heidi's daughter, Amy, uh, and we pray that there's successful uh, surgery in, in upcoming days. Lord, we thank you that the pandemic has waned and pray that we may all soon gather together for worship. Lord, we ask you to be with the families who have lost loved ones and ask for your continued presence and comfort. We thank you for Lee reaching his funding goal and ask for guidance as he prepares for your mission with World Witness. Lord, please be with Nick, Jim, Buddy, Dot, Paul, and Ramsey as they minister here for your kingdom. We pray for Zishan Sadad's health and for his ministry in Pakistan. Lord, please protect Christians in Ukraine, Belarus, Afghanistan, and China. We pray for the Hornbacks as they minister in Belarus and for the Wittigs and Allers and other missionaries who are caring for refugees in Spain, Germany, Poland, and Lithuania. Lord, please forgive us the horrors of abortion in our country and end this scourge. Please heal the families who have been harmed by this plague. Lord, we ask that you would humble us to forgive our sins and heal our land. Lord, please give our leaders your guidance and wisdom and desire to follow you. Lord, we ask for protection for first responders, police, firefighters, and for service members. Jesus, we trust in your holy name. Amen. You may be seated. And as you are, you can turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, or in your bulletin, which is also going to give you Ephesians chapter 1, page 9 in the bulletin. Ephesians 1, we will take it up from verse 15 through the end of the chapter. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And He put all things under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. The Word of God for the people of God. You've all heard it, and most likely in different circumstances and situations. Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. You've heard, hey, come here, I want you to see something. Right? And if you're a parent and your children say that to each other, it's a bad thing. You, you, you go find out what they're doing. But if someone comes to you and says, hey, I want you to see something, come here. I want to show you something. You know that they're going to show you something either, even, uh, either better than you're thinking, more unusual than you're thinking, or something so grand that it might take your breath away, or a meme on your phone. But other than that, ordinarily it's something more than what you're expecting. I want you to see something. And so in our text, Paul, Paul is saying, I want you to see something. He's calling you over, but, but he's not saying it to you, he's actually, well, in context, come out of the great blessing that God has been giving. That, that blessedness that we said, that, that, that long sentence from verse 3 to 14 where God just pours out one thing after another, that calling to which we are called, where we saw those, those seven verbs that God does for us. Remember, He blessed us, He chose us, He predestined us, He bestowed upon us, He lavished on us, He made known unto us, and He unites us in Christ together. That blessing, that overflow of blessing in Paul, that language that, that, that He gave to us, that we are to rejoice in Him, it has stirred Him up, and now, in response to it, He's just begun praying. In the middle of writing a note, now, I've done a lot of things when I'm trying to write or read. I've fallen asleep and scribbled over, but I've never begun praying in this sort of good way. Paul is moved, and he's moved to prayer, and he wants you to be moved too. He wants you to see. As a matter of fact, he tells you, he prays that your eyes might be enlightened. In what? Well, in the calling that God's given you. Remember we said that Ephesians breaks out really into that, that, that calling and walking, that God calls us in grace, He calls us in a grand way that we might walk worthy. And that walking worthy, we said, is on that, that scale where, where you have God's grace that's set here and then the wor worthy walking and they balance out. That's the maturity of the Christian life. And so this has moved him to prayer. The calling of God has moved him so that, so that he's praying now about this call and our maturity. And so as we look at this text, it's going to continue to press in upon us the, the beauty of God's calling. And it's going to do so in a way that's exclusively about the calling. It's not, it's not dealing with the walking. It's dealing with God's calling. What it is that 
pulls us out of this world and makes us Christians and sets us on a path to maturity that we might be brought up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Not as individuals, but as His body. We're going to see that this morning in two points. We're going to see firstly Paul's prayer. Secondly, we're going to see God's power. Paul's prayer, and then God's power. What is Paul's prayer? Well, he's just finished that, that prayerful first section. It's, it's not a prayer. It's, it's actually a description and praise to God. But, but the language in it is, is prayerful, blessed. We don't normally use the word blessed or blessed unless we're praying and we're asking God to bless or thanking Him for His blessings. But Paul sets it out that we might be joining in with Him in this prayerful language. Why does he begin with it? Well, because prayer is the language of God's people. We grow up in Christ as we grow in our understanding of prayer. A lot of us have an understanding of prayer that is simply this. Set times in the morning before my family gets up, I will pray. And, and then at night with my family or before I go to bed, I will pray. And, and using language, we, and it's okay to use language, but we usually go through things like this in our mind. Uh, okay, acts. I need to remember to pray. I need to adore. I need to confess. I need to give thanks, and I need to give supplication. And, and we run through those things, and we, we make prayer more formal than it's necessary. Paul, Paul is spilling over as he remembers what God has done. And he can't contain it. He doesn't wait for some set mark. And so here he is. He gives us this, this prayer. And this prayer is looking at the work of God in the beginning that God is calling us out to draw us up into this maturity, into this fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. And so as he prays then, Paul Paul's going to pray big things for you. He's going to pray big things that you and I might, that we might really know the very salvation which God has brought to us. He's going to pray for five things. You likely caught them as we read them. He's going to pray for wisdom and revelation. He's going to pray that the eyes of your hearts or understanding might be enlightened. He's going to pray that you might have hope of His calling. He's going to pray that you'll know the riches of the glory of His inheritance. And He's going to pray about the exceeding greatness of His power. He's praying this, that you might be caught up in what God is doing. So let's look at what He's praying for, for you and for me. Because He's praying for the saints. What's He praying? He says... He's praying for wisdom and revelation. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit or the spirit of wisdom and of revelation. What's he asking for you there? I mean, we can just read over these words and think, okay, Paul, that's pretty good stuff, but uh, we don't pause to think about it. What is he asking for with wisdom and revelation? He's praying that God would give them that, that sort of wisdom and knowledge of himself that is from himself. There's always something better about a first-hand knowledge than a second-hand knowledge. Think about this. Let's say you're being set up on a blind date and you are being told about this person. Oh, they, you just can't imagine. They dress well. They, they are beautiful. They are, they are fantastic. They are over the top in their knowledge, their love for God, their zeal. And, well, that's great. That can, that can really stir you up, but that's not a connection. That's only about, that's not from. Now, when you actually meet that person, 
and you find out that they are more they are more than, than you ever thought they could be. They, they really are beautiful inside and out. They really are fantastic. They really do love the Lord, and they really are compatible with you, and they begin to tell you about themselves. That sort of knowledge is what causes you to fall in love. You don't fall in love with descriptions about. You fall in love with the knowledge of that one as they bring you into their life. And Paul is saying, I don't want you to just think about this life as something out there that you know about God. You're not just stacking cordwood where you gather a fact about God and another fact about God and another fact about God. That's not going to draw you up in love to Him. I want you to know Him. I want Him to reveal Himself to you. That's what He's praying for for you and for me, that you will know Him from Himself. That He might by His Spirit reveal Himself to you. That you might be brought to a true knowledge of God. Here's my question for you. In, in your Christian walk, as you as you learn about the Lord, as you focus on Him, as you are brought to church, as you think through the things of God, are they abstracted from knowing God Himself? Or are those things that you learn about Him being put in your heart in such a way they press in on you and your love to God is growing? We don't depersonalize, depersonalize our Christian walk. You are coming to know a person, God Himself, in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wants us to know that as he talks about the calling that we have. You are not just being called to abstract concepts. You are being called to Him. And now he's praying that we might have wisdom and revelation of God from God Himself. Then he goes on, doesn't he? That the eyes of your hearts will be enlightened. Their eyes might, their eyes might really know the hope that is theirs. Isn't that what he says? Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know. He wants you to grow. Having your eyes open to the reality of who God is and what God is doing, not back then, not to the Ephesians only, but right now, in you, in your life, in what He is doing by placing you, well, a member of heart. With these people, He's doing that. Working in such a way, He's wanting the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know, that you might understand more and more who God is, what He is doing, and you will probe deeper. That's what it means to grow up, to be brought into maturity. It doesn't mean a leaving off of the gospel. It doesn't mean a leaving the gospel for abstract thoughts and big theological words, it means growing into them. That you might know the Lord better. That you might know what is the hope to which He has called you. What, what's, what's your hope this morning? What is the hope to which you are being called? Called. Paul's not using hope abstractly. We use hope about a lot of things, and they are things that may or may not happen. I really hope the Braves win it all this year. I, I really hope that some other team wins. I, I don't know. Duke versus Carolina. I'm not telling you any side that I land on, because I don't know where you people land. But those sorts of things, those are abstract. Those aren't a real and grounded hope. That's not what Paul means when he says, to the hope of which you have been called. No, no, it's not some sort of nebulous cloud knowledge. He doesn't mean some sort of dream over which you have no control. No, no, what's biblical hope? Biblical hope is a a confident expectation 
that God will do what He says He will do. The confident expectation that God who has never yet let one of His promises fall to the ground is still in the business of not letting a single promise of His fall to the ground. And so you have a guaranteed result. It's not nebulous. You know the outcome. He tells it to you here. This is the revelation that you get more knowledge of Him in. And He tells you the result already. He wants you to have the hope of this calling brought home to you. The reality is those things that disappoint you a lot of times show you your false hope. That you've been putting your hope in the wrong place, in your job, in your health, in your, in your retirement fund, in, in getting the, the college application in on time and getting your first choice, in, in keeping friends for a lifetime. Those things are all, well, they're not a sure hope. And when they disappoint you, they show you that you've set up a lot of times hopes that are functional saviors. Because if your hope is growing in the calling to which you have been called, you understand that there is nothing, nothing greater than the work which God is doing. Grounding you, keeping you. And so he tells us this. He draws us in. This is what he's praying for us. And he tells us in Romans 5 that this is the hope that will never put us to shame. That we will never be let down by the hope that we have in the work that God is doing to make his church. So he's praying that for you. And then he goes on. That He wants you to know the hope which He has called you. What are the riches of His glorious inheritance of the saints? This is that building sure hope. God doesn't promise one thing and never deliver. And what is that glorious inheritance which He is promising to you that He is now saying to you? Paul is saying, I'm praying this for you. Is that you will more and more understand the greatness of of the inheritance which is yours. What is your inheritance? It's God Himself. It's that you, at the end of your days, get God Himself. Isn't that what He told Abraham? I am your exceeding great reward. Isn't that what the psalmist says in Psalm 73? Whom have I in heaven but you? You are my portion. You are my inheritance. And what God is saying to you is if I have made you mine, I have brought you into this family, and I am working in you, you can rest assured that you will receive an inheritance that is far more glorious than you could have imagined. Heaven, we can wrap our minds around heaven. We, we understand that that's going to be. But God... Him as your inheritance, Him as your portion, Him as the, the, in, well, the inheritance that you will have for all of your days. You can't wrap your mind around that. You get God for you in the face and person of Christ. And you have Him. And Paul is wanting you to be brought up in that knowledge. And so he's praying for you. He's praying for me that we don't get sidetracked and that we don't ever abstract Christianity, that we don't ever abstract salvation from Christ Himself, that He might be all of our hope and all of our inheritance, all of our portion. And Paul's praying that for us. And then he prays that we might know the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe. What's he praying for when he prays for that, that power? The, the greatness, that immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe. Well, 
That power is the power that began your salvation. But it didn't begin with you. It begins in Christ. And that's the next point. God's power. What's that power then? Paul is essentially saying in his prayer, Hey, hey, come here, I want, I want to show you something. I want you to understand this. I'm praying this for you. And you say, but how is that going to come about? Well, here's how. By God's power that He worked in Christ Jesus when He raised Him from the dead. Four, four things, right, that He's going to show us. Four things that He, he raised Him from the dead, that He seated Him at His right hand in heavenly places. He put all things under His feet and He gave Him as head over all things, even the church. You want to know how God is going to work in this prayer that Paul is doing it? In the same power by which, in which, and through which He worked in Christ. That ought to shore up your hope. Christ was raised from the dead, not left in the grave. That, that ought to shore up your hope. He didn't be raised to life like Lazarus only to die again. No, He was raised up and then ascended into heavenly places where what? He reigns as your King. He reigns as one able to, well, put all things under His feet. And the Lord is putting all things under His feet. And He gave them to us in the context of the church. You see, that blessing that God calls us to as He brings us to life, it's the same power at work in us now as He is shaping us into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And you need to understand as we pray this, as we think through this, it's not written to you simply as individuals. No, salvation is never a private, individualized game. It's always God's public work, what He's working out in His people. Let me read it for you because our translations don't always pick up on it. There are some that do, uh, but we'll not mention them. But here, let me read it for you. And I'm going to read it to you in a way that sort of spells it out in a way that... Well, North Carolinians predominantly understand. For this reason, because I have heard of y'all's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and y'all's love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for y'all, remembering y'all in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give y'all a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of y'all's hearts enlightened, that y'all may know what is the hope to which He has called y'all. What are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints? What is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe? Paul is not praying this simply that you might on your own privatized Christianity and abstract Christ from His church. God's power was never displayed simply outside of the working that He has always had in His covenant people. No, no, no. His power is seen as He drives us into Christ. God saves. He saves. And that's the easy part. It really is. He does it. But now the hard part follows. He's putting us into community. People who come from different backgrounds and different understandings and different thoughts and who have different, well, different baggage that they bring with them. And some people are going to annoy you and some people are going to sin in big ways. But the Lord is doing the hard work in us to bring us together into this community. Salvation's the easy part. He took care of that. You saw that, that power He exercised in Christ. The hard part now is calling us into that walk where we are made a community. People of Israel were brought out of Egypt with a strong hand and they didn't even get 11 days out. They grumbled. And they fought. 
And they went on with it, and it was such a way that, well, 40 years, God worked on them. He was forming them, shaping them into a community of people that He is that He was bringing them into this community of faith that they might be brought up into the fullness of the stature of Christ. And at the end of Moses' life, they're about to enter into the promised land. And God says to Moses, doesn't He? Great job, Moses. These people are they're going to go in. Everything's going to be great and it's going to go well. No. No, God calls Moses up onto that mountain. He says, now listen. I got some news for you, Moses. As soon as you are dead, they're going to go back to idolatry and they're going to stop seeking out all of these things you set before them. You you see, Paul's not praying for the easy part. He's praying now for the hard work of community that God will form in all of us, that we are all brought up into the fullness of the measure, of the stature of Christ. That's why... There is no individualized and isolated Christian life. There's no Christian life where it's acceptable for me and my family to isolate ourselves from from the the company of God's people who, who God has called together to demonstrate His power. I don't get to say, you know what, I'll I'll take church when I can, but travel ball is taking precedence right now. Your children need Jesus more than they need Paul. Your your children and you need Jesus more than you need a multi-million dollar contract that's the hope of some families. No, no, you don't get to isolate yourself in that sort of way so that you pick and choose when you want to be a part of the community. He is saying to you, you are brought in to the community whether you like it or not. And when you join with a body, they are always trying to pull you in. We, we looked at it sort of in that illustration last week with that, that old Scottish preacher. Right? The man had absented himself, not for, any good, not for health reasons, not because he was... Not well, not because there was some sort of uh, sickness that was... that. No, no, he had absented himself because he was picking and choosing his growth and grace. Or trying to. And that minister comes and he pulls that coal away from those other coals. And you understand, he's going to die out like that fire. Well, the body is always pulling you in and Paul is praying and he says as he prays that God's power is the only thing that can do it. And so he's saying, he's praying for the saints. Yes, saints, you, me, even with all of our baggage, even with all of our mix-ups, even with all of the stuff that comes in life, even though I may have yelled at my children in the car on the way over, and then when we got here, I'm like, you better smile, and put on that face. I didn't, by the way. It's just an illustration. But you better smile and get out there and put on your church face. Even with that sort of reality in which we live, Paul says to us, in the saints, God's power is at work. And His power is a mighty power, the same power which He raised Christ from the dead. That's how you have hope. It's the same power which seated Christ in the heavenly places above all other dominions, all other rulers. Christ cannot be bought. Christ cannot be overthrown. Christ has dominion. He is there. That's how you have hope. This is the power of God that does that. He is putting all things under His feet that That means that because God has said it and He's promised it, there's absolutely nothing outside of the power of Christ. And you have hope. Not nebulous, well, I hope my team wins hope, but hope God has always done it and not one word of His will fall to the ground. He always fulfills it. And so then... He puts all things under His feet. Strike any biblical thoughts? On Wednesday nights we said that all the rest of the Bible, this is Sinclair Ferguson, not me, 
uh, all the rest of the Bible is a footnote to Genesis 3.15. And the promise is that you know, He will crush the head of the serpent. He's put all things under Christ's feet. And you say, well, why, why is there still evil? Why is all of this still out there in the world? Well, like in any serpent... Even after they've had their head smashed, they are still dangerous for a time. You, you can kill a venomous snake and it can still envenomate you for up to 24 hours after they've died. They'll thrash around a bit as you stomp on them. No, no, Satan's not winning. He's thrashing around in his death throes. And here's the beauty of it. Paul's not praying this individualistically. He's praying this in light of the church. Remember, he's already said to the Romans, hasn't he? Soon the God of peace will crush Satan under y'all's feet. That's hope. Christ has done the work. You get to step on an already dead serpent. You have that hope. And so then in that, in that the power of God gave him as head over all things to the church. Paul is praying for us that we might be brought up in those five ways, that we might be brought to maturity. And in that, guess what? With Christ as the head and that power being exercised and those prayers still being answered, the church goes forward under Christ's power. And it's brought to fullness. It will never fall flat. He will accomplish His purpose. He will save His people. And He will bring them all the way home. Let's pray together. Almighty God, answer the prayer of the Apostle Paul. We ask that You will bring us up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and give to us that wisdom and revelation and that understanding and that enlightenment that we might grow in hope that we will inherit You. Lord, exercise Your great power in our midst that we might see it happen. Do this, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. As we come to the supper, we are coming to, well, to something in which God is saying to you, come here, I want to show you something. Come here, I want you to see this. This is the only, this is the only pictures of God that He's given to us by which we might see Him and see His work. And as we are brought to the supper, He is telling us, listen, I want you to see by what power I will bring all the hope that you have to fulfillment. It's in the pictured body of Christ torn for us and His blood poured out for us and in the hope of His resurrection. And because He has done that, He's able to fulfill every. Every word of promise that He's made. And so as we come to the table this morning, you might say, well, who's the table for and what is it? Well, the table is for any who have professed Christ and been baptized and made that profession before uh, the elders or pastors or leaders of their church and who, well, who are not under discipline of the church, who aren't saying, you know what, I... I don't need Christ that much. Or who are saying, you know what, I can do this on my own. Paul's prayer is not directed to you doing this, opening your own eyes, having your, your own hearts enlightened by your study. No. No, it's only as we come to Christ by faith that we are enlightened, that we have our hope strengthened, that we are, well, that we are carried forward the gospel. And so if you are holding on to your sin, if you, if you are under discipline, don't come. Because as this is a sign and seal of grace to us, 
a means of grace, it's also a means of judgment. For those whose hope's not in Christ. For those who would rather have sin than Christ. For those who don't know Jesus. And so if that's you, don't partake. But for the rest of us, by faith, as you receive the bread and as you receive the wine, look beyond them and look to Christ who offers Himself to you. He is your inheritance. He is your hope. And you put all your hope there. In Him. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which He was betrayed, He took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it, and He said, This is My body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. In the same way also, He took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in My blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of Me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. You proclaim the sure hope until He comes. Let's pray together. Almighty God, build up within us a hope in Christ Jesus. We ask that You will now set apart this simple bread and this simple wine, that though to our eye they, they be but bread and wine, to the eye of faith they set before us the Lord Jesus. And as we look beyond them to Him, that You will work in us to build us up that we might, that we might cling to the hope we have in Your promises. Do this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, take the bread and by faith look beyond it to the Lord Jesus and have your hope fed. Take and eat. Take the cup and by faith look beyond the wine to the Lord Jesus that He might enlighten your eyes, that He might fill your hope, and that He might grow you. Take and drink. Let's pray again. Almighty God, do, do work in Your people. We give You thanks that You have promised to work. That You have promised to work through ordinary means. And that as we make use of them and we look by faith to the One to whom they point, You grow us up in grace. And so we give You thanks for this opportunity. We ask You to work. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together as we sing number 644, May the Mind of Christ my Savior.
Amen. Remember, please be seated shortly or right after so we can have that congregational meeting. Visitors, you do not have to stay. All right. Everyone, people of God, lift up your hearts, lift up your eyes, and receive His blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.